In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. For the next few weeks, I'm going to be speaking to you on these podcasts about spiritual warfare. I don't believe that anyone who has lived as long as I have is not keenly aware of the fact that the church has fallen from the favor that we once had. We see spiritual warfare going on around us all the time. We see things happening in this country that we never dreamed would be happening, that are openly taught and to our children, and lies that are being pumped in on a daily basis. And we realize that we are in a spiritual war. And if he, in Second Corinthians 4 and 4, it says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. In Ephesians 2 and 2, it says, The ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. And then that frightening verse in 1 John 5 and 19, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. I don't know how many of you saw the movie The Matrix, but it was a movie about uh, machines becoming intelligent computers actually waging war against humanity. And in the war, it was fought so bad that uh, the atmosphere was burned up and the resources and elements were destroyed and, and there was a remnant that went underground. But the machines still needed a power source. And so they realized they could gain power from the bodies of human beings. And so they began to harvest human beings and put them in these capsules that looked like coffins. And they fed food into, uh, through tubes into these babies. And, and then they plugged into their head a computer program. And while they were laying in these capsules, they believed that they were outside living in a world that was a world of lies. In fact, I like what Morpheus said. He said, the matrix is a system, Neo. That system is our enemy. But when you're inside, you look around and what do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters. The very minds of the people we're trying to save. But until we do, these people are still a part of that system. And that makes them our enemy. You have to understand Most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. And many of them are so injured and so helplessly dependent on the system that they will fight to protect it. And that's the way I believe it is in this world that we live today. The God of this world has blinded the minds of everyone with lies. We're hearing lies being pumped into our minds through the music that we hear, through the television programs that we watch, uh, through the politics that we listen to, and on and on it goes. I wish we had spiritual visine. (laughs) We could put it in our eyes and our eyes would be open to what's going on around us, to understanding the lies that are being told to us. When it comes to the spiritual war, it's fought on three battlefronts. First of all, there's the battles that are fought daily between God and Satan. The forces of God, which work through the word of God today, are being attacked by the the lies of Satan. We are trying to get our meanings for life and for everything else from the the lies, or are we going to take it from the word of God? That's basically the choice that we have to make then the second level is between christ's church and the world system ruled by our spiritual enemy in fact uh, jesus said in in john 15 that if the world hates you keep in mind that it hated me first if you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. 
That is why the world hates you. Remember I told you a servant is not greater than his master? If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. They do not know God, and they hate the name of Jesus. I have a little cartoon on my desk, and that cartoon shows three, three young children sitting on a bench in front of the principal's office, and it's obvious that they're in trouble. And one child says, I said the S word. And the other child said, I said the F word. And the other child said, I said Christmas. You have to laugh to keep from crying. Who would have ever dreamed that we've come to the point where just a child saying the word Christmas, because it has Christ in it, that that child could actually get in trouble? No one would have ever dreamed that. Not that long ago. But today there is a concerted effort against Christianity and anything that bears the name of Christ. I saw this past week that MIT has now stated, that, and I saw this on, on a program, a news program, that the word God cannot be used in the commencement at any time, even in prayers. And the sad thing is, as the announcement was made, there were cheers going up from the audience. We are under attack. And just like those that lived in the matrix were living in a lie and and a delusion, today the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. And though these people, even though these people can sometimes even be our friends and our family, And they can become very hostile. Jesus said in Matthew 10, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemy will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their lives or or take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Just like our young men and women of the armed forces are making a commitment to give up their very lives to protect our country, we have to be willing to give up our very lives to stand up for Jesus Christ, even if it means our own family turns against us. Then the second place, the third place that the spiritual warfare takes place on, plain that it takes place on, is within every child of God, between the Holy Spirit and the lust of the carnal flesh. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 17 it says, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict. That's a wartime word with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. I think for today, the most important thing that we can remember in our spiritual warfare, as we are children of God, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, knowing that that the ultimate end is going to be victory for Jesus, and that we have victory in heaven, but also knowing that we're smack dab in the middle of enemy territory, is that we must recognize the lies. Because the lies are Satan's greatest effective weapon in the spiritual warfare. Our supreme commander, Dwight D. Eisenhower, knew that in order to win the Second World War, he must invade Europe. And uh, Hitler also knew this. The Nazis knew that in order for there to be a victory uh, by our allied forces, there must be an invasion. 
And they also knew that that invasion had to come from England because, uh, and, and the invasion had to take place in southern France somewhere because airplanes in those days could only range about 400 miles. So it was only in a 200-mile stretch that the air support could be supplied to an invading force. So the question was really, where would it be? Well, it was because of what they called Operation Fortitude that there was the greatest fake army and lie in history. You see, what the Allies did and what General Eisenhower did is they knew that Hitler and the Nazis believed that Patton was the greatest general to ever live. And they knew that an invasion would have to be led by Patton. So what they did was they sent Patton to England right across the border from southern France in a place called Pate Calais. And not only did they send Patton there, but they built all of these rubber tanks and rubber airplanes and rubber troop carriers. So they had a whole army of these rubber <laughs> uh, instruments of war. And at night, uh, they would move them around. And they also sent messages across the sea, messages about an impending invasion uh, into Calais. And those messages were so effective that Hitler believed they were going to invade there, and he sent uh, a million forces, a million uh, of his army there to Calais. Um, and when he did, Eisenhower and our Allied forces landed in Normandy and the beaches right around there. Now, don't get me wrong, our soldiers won because of courage and determination. They were still heavily fortified with bunkers and had some soldiers there to fight against them. But if they would have run into that kind of resistance, plus a million Nazi soldiers, you and I would be speaking German today. I like what Winston Churchill said. In wartime, truth is so precious that she should always be attended by a bodyguard of lies. Lies are a very powerful weapon in war. And we, in fact, created an uh, agency called the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. And their main job was and is to get information and gather intelligence on the enemy. And that's what we're going to be doing in this series of podcasts, gathering information on our enemy. In 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, it says, Be self-controlled and alert your enemy. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone he can devour. If this podcast has been uh, of help to you, then please go to johndkimbrough.com. Thank you.